Salam, peace. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and you're watching Galaxy 19 Satellite for Muslim Network TV. And you are also on Amazon Fire TV, Raku, Apple TV, as well as our website, muslimnetwork.tv. It was uh, a while ago, close to 25 years ago, that among uh, many Muslim leaders, I was invited to have a meeting with Cardinal Bernardine. And we have good conversation. Uh, I found uh, that Catholic uh, Cardinal uh, to be a very nice person. And he told us, frankly, that he received a letter from Pope uh, to meet Muslim community, and that's why he's meeting. Very obedient, I guess. Well, cardinals probably listen to their popes. The Muslims have no popes. And Muslim in that meeting, everybody was talking everything else. And Cardinal Bernardine started talking about one particular point. He said, Catholic schools are closing. Well, I hear Muslims are opening schools. Why not we think of collaboration that Muslim, we have buildings and infrastructures and systems that Muslims participate with us. And of course, math is math and science is science. And when it comes to uh, religious studies, uh, those could be Muslim uh, do uh, teachings of Islam and we Catholic do our own teachings. That conversation, I don't know if it ever were formally adopted by the Muslim community, but I came to know a whole lot of Muslim children, Muslim parents send their children to Catholic schools. Actually, there are, uh, there, there are a couple of universities, Catholic universities in Chicago, with a very high percentage of uh, Muslim students um, giving uh, several tens of millions of dollars in, uh, in, in fee contributions to the Catholic institutions. And some of those places, Catholics also uh, care enough to have a place of worship for Muslims and uh, a proper system of incorporating their ideas and thought. So that relationship was coming into being when there was hardly any Muslim school but one. Muslim schools in Chicago has been many. When I came here first time, 1977, there were one Muslim school called Sister Clara Muhammad School. That school, unfortunately, no longer with the Imam W. Din Muhammad community, uh, but there are many other schools. How many? We'll find out. How many Muslim schools in North America? How this phenomena began? To discuss all of that with us is one person who is in the middle of it all. He is Mr. Habib Qadri. Welcome to Muslim Network TV, Habib Qadri. Thank you, Imam Malik Mujahid. All right. Uh, Habib Qadri is uh, superintendent of the Muslim uh, Community Center Academy or MCC Academy in Skokie and Martin Grove. He's an author and lecturer on Islam and social problems confronting Muslim youth. He also serves on the board of a prestigious uh, Muslim publishing institutions, Iqra Foundation. Uh, welcome. How are you? Good. I'm, I'm doing well. Thank All you right. for having me. All right, good to know. So I, I sort of, you know, seeing you all the time in education, I, I sort of visualize myself thinking, well, when he was about five year old, he told his father he gonna grow up and become a principal of some schools. Was that the case? Not quite, but uh, I, through time, I think my process of, of being involved um, in the community. So I'm, you know, working with the youth groups uh, at, at a young age. Uh, but my dad did kind of start the process because when I complained about the weekend school, uh, like a Sunday school religious kind of program on the weekends. Uh, when I graduated eighth grade or as a 13 year old, he said, well, why don't you do something about it? And I started teaching at 14 preschool, pre-K classes. 
And from there, I kept on uh, teaching for about 15, 20 years until I was 21, 22, even at college. I used to come on the Sunday to teach. Uh, and that started the whole process with that and youth groups and, and, and programming. And uh, I felt like that's, uh, that was my calling. <laughs> okay. So, so, well, boy, teens uh, setting their course, uh, that's amazing. I mean, uh, I have people who are at the university and they have no idea what they're going to do, be doing. Uh, so were there any other ideas you wanted to do with your life? Oh, I mean, for sure, there there are others. If it wasn't for business, but you know, it was another idea. But sports, I mean, I played sports for many years. And, uh, you know, like any child, you want to have that dream to be that first uh, uh, in, in Indian Muslim basketball player in the NBA. So, you know, high school, college after that, that I realized, it, it, but it, it helped me. It, it kind of connected me to, you know, uh, with the, you know, not the community, but the school body and, and build you know, a lot of uh, strong um, confidence in me. So I, I think so overall, but I knew I, w I wanted to do something to help people. So that kind of helped out uh, my, you know, both my parents have been kind of involved in, in the community. And my mom has been teaching weekend school for about 50 years. And my mom's prayer was that I become an Islamic scholar. That's her, that's her, that was her oh, okay. supplication. So I said, look, I can't, I, you know, maybe, you know, well, God knows, but I'm not an Islamic scholar, but I said, well, you know what, you know, hopefully I could train people to become Islamic scholars. <laughs> okay. So is your mom you happy with you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, hopefully. <laughs> okay. I pray. I pray. <laughs> I mean, inshallah. Oh, so God willing. So I, I remember you're superintendent of uh, MCC Academy in Martin Grove and Skokie. I remember a long time ago uh, being invited because there is a protest that Muslim cannot own that primary school. And there were several neighbors and interfaith people who came in solidarity. I still have Sound Vision is still Sound Vision recorded that event, and we have the beautiful uh, memories of that. So there were resistance even for Muslims to own a building which was not which was being paid for, which was empty. Uh, has situation with the neighbors improved since then? Uh, quite a bit, you know, and, and just for, for, for people to have a better context, 1989, Persian Gulf War is happening. The, the Muslim community uh, uh, in an auction wins this building. They find out Muslims buy it. They decided to go ahead and say, you know what, we're going to have a referendum to buy it back. Right. And so I remember being a 13, 14 year old going and passing out flyers about, you know, about who we are and, you know, to, to support uh, us keeping the building. So that was in 1989. Then in 2002, so I come back, you know, I'm in Michigan, I come back to uh, uh, leaving the public school sector. And in 2002, they denied us even expanding and building um, a mosque, right? So now we have the building, we're there for some time. Then they have this process of, well, you know, we don't have enough land to expand on, which we, if anyone's been there, there's enough land, there's enough parking and there's enough, like a big soccer field. So but what, one of the key factors that play, uh, what was very important was to build that interaction. And I think that's something that we have done, uh, having a good relationship uh, with, 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 the, with the mayor, with the, uh, the village board, but also the police department, fire department, and then our local school uh, districts. And I think that has helped where now it's, it's the population of Muslims uh, in, that, in, in that area are very, uh, are, is very big in the public school sector, even in our own school. But also what's been very important is that we've had also some individuals now be part of the village board and in various different uh, areas uh, to be being commissioners. So I think that plays a big part. And when the more their interaction happens, the greater the learning happens. Right. And then that's kind of been this, uh, a big significant push that we've had really pushed uh, uh, our community to get more involved and not just only talk to the village when we need something, but also what can we do to help them? to make our, our community better. So are some of those people who opposed uh, initially or campaign mm -hmm. against that, that will buy back? Of course, the federal government got involved and uh, there was a lawsuit. And so, so opposition was defeated. But are some of those people who are opposed to, have we been able to win them over so they understand it better or they just lost it? You know, I, I think, you know, there, there are always going to be a few who might maybe, maybe moved, 
right? So that 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 has happened. But then you have the, a lot of the, the our community now are very happy, right? You know, even are you know the, the fear like when we come here, you know, the housing the market will go low. I mean, it's one of the most expensive places to now move to, right? So you have in the sense of the cost value, uh, the support. Our kids are, are, are have done well in the school districts. So what it happens is, I think more and more, you they've seen people as they got to interact with us, they felt very comfortable. You know, we we, we participate in the Fourth of July parade. We, we uh, participate in many of the school activities and the community activities that the mayor uh, sets up. We even uh, last year sponsored the the, the Fourth of July parade, uh, not just participating, but even in funding some of that. The Morongo Foundation is another one that yearly that they generate money for a lot of the uh, uh, programs for community service programs in Morongo uh, to the Niles Food Pantry. So there are various other avenues. What we've done is to get involved. So those individuals that maybe had some uh, concerns or resentment, and I felt that many of them just had the fear of the unknown because at that time it was right after 9-11. And so when they got to start meeting with us and introducing us uh, and, and having uh, conversations and programs and inviting them to our food and fun fair, to our, our dinners, it changed the ball game. And I think there, it's, it's really has shifted. And a lot of those who maybe were concerned are not concerned anymore, but there's things that we could always do to keep on improving and getting, uh, making things better. There was a study, I forgot the name, but he was father of the, uh, you know, school integration uh, program. I think Mr. Coleman, if I remember him correctly, I heard his lecture at the University of Chicago. Um, it seems over there at that time, probably I was the only student because um, all look like professors who were attending to his. He did a research that uh, wherever there is a private school, the quality of prop, prop, uh, you know private school rubs off to close by uh, public schools and the quality of public school goes up because of that. And he said that by saying that I'm about to commit a heresy, then he presented his data. Do you think uh, the Muslim community, among African-American community, there is a general uh, knowledge in the African-American community. I mean, I live among African-Americans that whenever a Muslim have a mosque or businesses, the crimes goes down the neighborhood. I mean, Imam Siraj Wahaj, I mean, his whole neighborhood transformed completely. Uh, but do you think the Muslim community uh, you know, buying that building, other people coming in, you say relationship is good, but have we contributed to property value going up, overall quality of life improving in that area? Yeah, I, I, if you look into the Morton Grove area, just to, the property has only gone up, right? Uh, and then you see, you've seen that uh, effect. You've seen businesses even open up in our area, which are Muslim owned businesses. Uh, you also have individuals, like if you think even a public school where many of our school kids go to, uh, it's maybe the uh, second uh, public school, at least in, uh, in 1994, 95, to start like a Muslim club. So they have Muslim prayers in both of the pl uh, pray, uh, places after school. But also many of the students are one of your top students, right? The National Merit Scholars, you will have that many of those uh, Illinois scholars there's a high percentage of Muslim students. So, so you've seen that they've also done well from on the academic aspect of it, for many of the, uh, the debate after school clubs and even athletes. Uh, you had one, uh, one of our young ladies who was recognized for wearing a scarf and then they did a whole uh, article about her. So you've seen various uh, individuals who have not just, uh, you know, not just celebrating their faith, but also making sure they're, they're part of the Morton Grove, Skokie, Niles Township uh, 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 community and making sure that community is better and not just our own mus musjid community, but making sure that it playing a big impact in, in helping others out. Uh, and you'll see those kind of specific things are happening uh, more and more throughout as our kids are, are getting involved in, in, in the community projects. This is Imam Malik Mujahid and I'm talking with uh, Mr. Habib Padri, who is the superintendent of MCC Academy System. We'll be right back after these messages.
what was it like when you started this network out, when you started Sound Vision those many years ago? You know, after 9-11, uh, one lady called me and she says, Where, what is your channel which I can watch? And I say, I'm sorry, we don't have a channel. Mm. And you know what she said? She said, then how America will know about you? SubhanAllah. A anything you want to say to the people who are watching? That we had one sister who messaged that she's, she grew up on Sound Vision. What do you say to the people who have been long supporters? Thank you. Thank you. It is because of you we are able to do all of that. So the generation of Adam's world, you need to take it over for the next generation. And that's my invitation to you. So keep telling everybody where to watch. They can watch it on Galaxy 19 satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, or easy thing, muslimnetwork.tv, or our YouTube channel, or our Facebook channel. And with your help, inshallah, ladies, the one who called me, what channel should I watch Muslims on? Mm. Answer is here and now. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. Adam's World Believe me there's a lot to see Bismillah Let's explore Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Malik Mujahid and you're watching uh, Muslim Network TV on Galaxy 19 satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Raku, as well as muslimnetwork.tv. And I'm talking with uh, Mr. Habib Qadri, who is uh, was a principal now superintendent of a Muslim school system in Chicagoland area. Last year, you were honored by the White House, we were invited to be honored in White House uh, as uh, one of the five uh, private school principal uh, for the, your educational leadership. Well, um, uh, what, how it came about and how you felt about being honored in White House? Oh, you know, you know, for any, any it's, it's always exciting to be recognized for the work you do. And I think for me, especially being a Muslim American, I think it was very important for, uh, to show kids that you know, in any field, you do your best, God will take care of the rest. And then, and, and sometimes you might not get recognized here, but even a small school like this can be recognized for the work you're doing here uh, at a national level, right? And I think it was great because it was also for the community and for the teachers, for the work they did to show, because you know, they were looking at various things, right? So when was academic success? Have you seen growth? And being there for 16 years, I kept all the data and saying, look, hey, this is what, what has happened when someone when they informed me that someone nominated me, and but here's the criteria, things that we need to, when you are going to be in a pool of other individuals to see uh, where you stand, you know, they looked at the academic success. We, you know, they looked at, you know, after, you know, uh, supporting school culture and climate. So you know, what the programs that we did for that, uh, after school programs, right? We started from maybe one to two to 40 different after school uh, clubs. Uh, uh, looking at community relations and some of the programs that we have done uh, throughout uh, the community and even internationally. We've had more than eight, nine different countries, uh, uh, school ministers, our educators come and visit our school. And so the impact of some of the things that we have done, it was great to see that all that work that all the staff did, you know, I maybe it helped facilitate it, but everyone doing that work kind of came together. And then so I call that award for the community. And I, I was qu quite exciting and getting to see a fellow educators uh, throughout the United States what was very uh, humbling and exciting. And it was, it was great to see some of that work uh, be you know, recognized. It's always 
everyone, you know, it's, it's, you know, in our faith, you try to be humble about it, but it's, it's always good to hear or good to see that things are getting recognized. And I feel like it was a great uh, 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 excitement for me and my family, but also for the community. Well, thank you so much uh, for your work uh, because Muslim community get recognized through the work uh, Muslim individuals do. And when they do a bad job, uh, <laughs> 9-11, <laughs> that takes all of us down. Right. Well, you have to work hard <laughs> to, to take, the, take the community forward. Now, answer that question which Cardinal Bernardine raised. Uh, while the Catholic have infrastructures, more building, their schools are closing down, mm -hmm. while Muslims are opening new schools. So why, why Muslims are opening new schools and instead of collaborating and working with the system which is already out there? I think, you know, you know there are always going to be schools and, and, and everyone has to make that personal decision. But I think when you, even when you look at many other faiths, the Jewish schools or even see the Catholic schools and the Protestants, like, you know, I, I chair the Illinois Coalition of Non-Public Schools. So there's 17 associations that we represent, 2,000 uh, schools. So all of them, there, you know, so you have the Montessori, our independent schools. Then you have private schools, Lutheran schools, uh, and, and, you know, and evangelical schools. So everyone that ha has sometimes that feeling that we want to make sure that they get their education, but also building that foundation of identity of who they are. And sometimes being in a, somewhere in a school for eight hours, if you there, if there could be an opportunity for a, a parent uh, to send their child where they get the academic standards, but at the same time, getting some experience of to get to know them, who they are and their faith and their experience and kind of build that and understand how they can become a better Muslim American that is sometimes, you know, for, for and the parents that helps in that process. And especially, I think, when you are now in a, in a country, second, third, fourth generation, in a few years, you are, it's human nature that sometimes people lose their identity after three, four generations. And I think to making sure their core of their spirituality or their faith uh, to instill that, sometimes the school builds that. So some parents might go from preschool to third grade. Some might go up to fifth grade. Some might go up to eighth grade. Some might go through to high school. Some might experience for one or two years. But I think the more we parents have seen as they are growing up here, and I also see my generation where sometimes the weekend school they learn, but they maybe didn't have all that knowledge, and they feel like here's an opportunity institution that could help build that uh, 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 that strong base of faith in them and 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 and, and the and the and the character, uh, and, but also develop their minds to be successful people in this world and also successful people in the hereafter. Okay, so that's a lot of success you're demanding. Of course, we pray for that every day, all the time. How many Muslim schools are there in the United States? Uh, about 285, and I think only get, uh, becoming bigger, uh, but at least uh, as from Islam, uh, Islamic School League of America, when they did their last research, and that was about six, seven years ago, it was at 275. But I'm thinking now that 285 to 295, because even in, in the Chicagoland area, there's about 15 to 16 and, and, and growing, uh, you know, which would say registered by the state uh, uh, schools. Uh, so I think it, it is uh, something that's been on the rise. But at the same time, what's happening is it's making sure that we also provide the proper quality. And, and we have to make sure that we always have this yearning to get better. Because like anything else, you know, if you don't take care of it, then it, it could slowly go, go away. Right. And so I think that's something that we're going to have to keep on developing and kind of working and, and making sure we, when we're doing decisions, we're doing things that are proper. How many students at the MCC Academy? Uh, right now, we're at 735 students, you know, okay. on the full time. And then the week after school programs we do, we have about 250 extra students. And how many teachers? Uh, altogether, staff is about 100. So a teacher is about 70. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So is this the proper ratio in America to serve students properly? Uh, I mean, for, I mean, our school is a little bit bigger than majority of other schools, right? So that's something just to kind of keep in mind. So I think we're in a unique situation here. Uh, but I, I think what, what we need people to understand is that there are the ratio, many schools, you might have 100 kids, 200, uh, 200 kids, uh, 1 to 25 ratio, 1 to 20, all depends on, you know, uh, their approach. But due to sometimes the 
the economic challenges, uh, you would have to kind of, you know, you can't have that idea one to 10 uh, because we're trying to also keep it the cost. Like at our school, it's very important for us to have it diverse. We have 46 different countries at our school. Uh, we have specific seats for refugee students, for specific uh, students from the inner city. We are trying to make sure that we accommodate in building scholarships and stuff and not to, uh, pr uh, pr pr uh, to, to make the tuition at such a price that's only for a specific group of people. So I think a lot of schools are going through that challenges and trying to develop that cost effective program. But, uh, so you'll see the numbers and the staff in, uh, change due to the circumstances and financial uh, situations. Hmm. Does bullying uh, goes on in Muslim schools as well? Sure. I mean, like like anything, you know, that is it can can it happen? Yes. It can you know? And is is that something that could be a challenge? No doubt about it. Because when you have so many different students, there are always going to be some students there. But what are you doing and what are we building? Right. So it can't just be like, oh, when something happens, how to deal with it? How are you building the school format to lessen those things to happen? Right. It could be social dynamics to even bullying, are 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 are, are just making sure they're culturally more aware of their behavior and word usage. So. That is something that when people say, well, uh, you're sending them to like a religious uh, institution that nothing wrong happens. Uh, look, life, kids are kids. Life is life. I always remind people, even in parents, like, oh, my God, I sent them to a religious school. I, someone said that one kid was swearing. OK, I'm like, well, you could go to a, a so-called Muslim country and you'll see some things that which are not very Muslim like. <laughs> so I always remind people there are going to be challenges. And that's the part of an educator or the school, working with the parents, working with all the stakeholders, so try to have the best environment possible for them to be successful individuals. Um, a, a couple of incidents I'm available, uh, I'm aware of, involving three schools, mm -hmm. uh, where African American and African students uh, were either refused admission mm -hmm. or felt uncomfortable and withdrew. Mm -hmm. So do you have African uh, students and uh, how the issues of race, which are so common in our society, are handled uh, in your system? Uh, we, we do have uh, students who are, are, are Black, are African-American, and then we also have quite a bit from Africa. Uh, uh, so, th th you know, that is something that no doubt about it, can there is a situation happen? And that's why it's so important from the leadership training, uh, making sure they themselves are aware of making sure cultural awareness and sensitivity. Sometimes we just think Muslims like, oh, we're all Muslims and, and uh, we all get along. No, we all have our biases, prejudices sometimes and our stereotypes. Uh, and so it's so important to make sure that we get that, you know, that out of our system and being aware of our own as leaders, but then our teachers and then also the students, right? It's, it's all, all three phases. Sometimes we're like the students. I'm like, no, we got to make sure even our teachers, how they're speaking to individuals from different ethnic groups, diverse, uh, diverse groups, uh, plays a big part. So I think in some situation that happens, what are the steps that we have to make sure to rectify a situation are things that our schools have to keep in mind. So that's why I'm always, I, I think it's first thing we have to realize that things can happen. Things, and, and we have to see how we can improve to make them better. And I think that's the Are first you thing. aware of any incidents in your school when some people, administration, teachers, or other students harass black students? No, we ha I mean, how at least that we know of, we have not had like a harass harassment uh, of students. But there has there been a situation where when, like students have talked to each other or when uh, students uh, feel maybe, hey, you know what, we once had a whole conversation before we didn't take Martin Luther King Day off. So I remember talking to the, 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 uh, some of our parents and saying, what do you think? Would it be better to have school and do a program or should we not have it? So that was kind of brought up. Right now, could there be a, a situation where once uh, I think a second grader talked about one kid's like, hey, you're white or you're black, right? You know, so I think those kind of conversations could happen. Our students, when they're singing a rap or singing a rap song and they use the N-word, right? Even if I'm like, hey, you can't speak that or if you're even having those. So those are conversations that, that could be uh, discussed as we have, like, you know, a lot of times it would, as principals and talking about with individuals. So those are conversations I could see that are that might happen by anything that came to a point where, like, hey, we had to bring parents in and so on and so forth. No, but uh, can, can I say, hey, it might, it might not have happened. I did not know about it. There might be. But what we try to do is, uh, you know, uh, 
one of the things is to why we build school climate culture is to check it, check in with many of our minority students, even in Islamic school, to see, hey, what's your thoughts? Like even before eighth grade graduation, I, I have lunch with every student. Uh, um, and then uh, even those lower grades with the, uh, with the different classes by boys, sometimes, uh, you know, I just talk to them and see what their thoughts are from the girls' perspective on certain things. So, but it helps, it gives me a better idea uh, of that. And then we highlight every child at our school. So every child in our school, it will be one time in front of the whole school and, and, and be introduced who they are, favorite color, favorite food, what, 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 it's something to get to know them uh, about them. So this is something that kind of helps everyone to be at least recognized and get to know who they are. Uh, so and so I think there are steps, but uh, at least uh, I'm, at least that I know of not, nothing major. But uh, can, can there have uh, there has can there be room for improvement? No doubt about it. There was a news item in the media uh, that a Muslim uh, girl hanged herself to death in the parking lot of uh, your school. Mm -hmm. um, what was it and what message uh, did the Muslim school and the Muslim leadership drew from that? Uh, so uh, uh, two things. Uh, first and foremost, yeah, you know, I just wanted to clarify because when you say this for our school, it was not one of our students. So to get that uh, clear, because I was once sent to by someone stating that. So I want to get that very clear. Uh, the second thing is that child had also some special needs and other difficulties be beforehand. So when that situation did happen, uh, you know, the school district had informed us about it. So we had met with the parents. Uh, the, the, the family wasn't uh, always uh, connected to our masjid. Uh, but we still that kind of kept it open with uh, the mom and the father had a specific other mosque that they would uh, attend. So, but at the same time, we use that as a, also, also a learning tool. Uh, so I think it was uh, our, so I think it was very important that having, you know, we wrote a, you know, I had wrote a whole piece on, you know, the idea of mental illness. Uh, and we have also two, sc two uh, school counselors at our school, uh, social workers that we work with Clio Center. So I think, you know, those are kind of steps and I was aware and we know, realize that it is something that's happening more and more and, uh, with our, 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 our students, uh, 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 families that that could happen, but even our community. Right. And so even in that year, there were about five suicides in the whole United States that we knew from the Muslim community. So I think that kind of by itself kind of brings up that conversation and, and saying, but a lot of times also it's for parents to be aware that when a child is going through something to get support to get resources. When the social worker says, hey, so your child's going through it, no, don't worry, we'll take care of it. And that's that conversation that needs to happen. And, and, and Allah protect and Allah have mercy on her soul because I think what it, it is also made parents aware and saying, we can't just let go like, okay, you know, don't worry, it's lack of Iman. Or, hey, you know what, it's just, you know, they're just being uh, sensitive. And I think those are, uh, that was more of the key part I think that we kind of learned from is, making aware, bringing out resources, being, you know, you see now more and more workshops and parents open to go visit. Uh, even if you see Khalil Center, they're, they're now they're so busy that sometimes after there's a waiting list to get in. So you realize it's really opened up now to be not taboo to go speak to, uh, to uh, 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 a social worker, or a therapist or a counselor. Right. And I think, I think, uh, um, uh, that's something I, I realized it's really uh, in the sense of as these things were happening, the community is more and more aware to let's kind of confront these, uh, these situations. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Sima Malik Mujahid. I'm talking Mr. Habib Qadri. We'll be right back after these messages. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. Past campaigns covered a wide range of humanitarian concerns. Through Bosnia Task Force, Imams and leaders of Chicago's Muslim community worked to ensure Bosnia became a top national issue. This led to life-saving American policies in Bosnia. 
A key accomplishment was helping to get rape declared a war crime. Initiatives also included Kosovo Task Force, Central African Republic Task Force, and Flint Coalition, which brought awareness to the water crisis affecting the people of Flint, Michigan. Highlights of our work include supporting Black Lives Matter, Parliament of the World Religions, addressing climate change. So wasteful consumption starts the ruthless production, and that's where we need all the fossil fuel in the world. And prominent media exposure. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, uh, president of Justice for All. And I'm the director of outreach for Justice for All. And that's why we need to go back to what worked. Today we're demanding an apology uh, from the CEO of Costco. The Chinese crackdown on Uyghurs and other Turkic people has only gotten worse. Current programs such as Burma Task Force advocate for the right of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, internally displaced populations, and all those denied freedom of movement and at risk of starvation. Through this, we mobilized thousands of calls to elected representatives. This paved the way for the U.S. to increase funding for Rohingya refugees from $30 million to over $600 million. Two of our documentaries were featured on international news outlets. The Rohingya People, a slow-burning genocide on BBC World News, and Rohingya Refugees Tell of Massacre was featured on CNN. We've organized rallies, UN mission visits, expanded presentations on campuses, promoted research and report writing, outreach to think tanks, media, and other influencers. Faith Coalition educates about the Rohingya genocide and crimes against humanity faced by ethnic groups in Burma. We've traveled to refugee camps, convened a meeting of Karen, Kachin, and Rohingya leaders, both to encourage cooperation and to guide them in congressional outreach. We organized Rohingya Advocacy Day. This led to over 100 participants visiting the offices of 60 U.S. Senators and congressional representatives. Free Kashmir advocates for the people of Kashmir. Long-term goals include the call for self-determination, the end of the Indian military's occupation of the territory, and raising awareness of Kashmiri issues among the American people. After the August 5th reinvasion of Kashmir, we organized national protests in front of various Indian government buildings, partnered with Stand with Kashmir, and launched a petition condemning the Gates Foundation's decision to present Prime Minister Modi a humanitarian award. Save Uyghur informs Muslims and neighbors of other faiths about the ongoing cultural genocide of Uyghur Muslims and mobilizes public support. Our projects include boycotting Chinese products with our Fast From China campaign, pushing Bill S-178 in the Senate, and organizing a nationwide protest of Costco. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. You're watching us on Galaxy 19 Satellite. Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, and MuslimNetwork.tv. This is Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Habib Qadri, who is superintendent of MCC Academy in the Chicago land. Um, you spend quite a bit of time writing books, traveling, guiding different other schools across the country. Uh, I mean, your whole life seems to be involved around Muslim education and uh, things of this nature. Um, how do you keep up your own learning process? How you uh, are you also learning, improving, and growing because your responsibilities, connection, and impact seems to be growing? Uh, yes, I think for anyone, you know, when you know when you're writing about youth, uh, you know, so it, it's very important to kind of have your own personal. 
a person that you connect with. So, you know, a teacher just to follow up on. So maybe from the religious aspect to kind of keeping self, keeping up with that, but from the educational. So I myself, you know, have an opportunity now for the last, I think it's been a decade uh, where I'm almost every summer at, uh, at a university, uh, at, at Harvard University, where, you know, I'm on the advisory board. So I have the opportunity to uh, keep on learning what's what's going out there, meeting with the professors and the newest research. Uh, we go every year and visit various school districts where a lot of our doctoral students are doing stuff. Um, and it, so it gives me an opportunity to see what the newest things are coming out, you know, making sure we're reading the journals and updated uh, uh, research that's coming, uh, what's very important. And then I think that kind of helps. And then, you know, just kind of visiting. I mean, when I have the opportunity to go visit from uh, at least maybe maybe 100 schools here and overseas, but I'm learning also. When you're going there, you're, you're picking up stuff. It's not just me giving them information, you know, and I always tell people the greatest learning is when you go experience and see stuff because you're trying to, as you're analyzing, you're also like, well, that's a great thing to do. That's a great thing to pick up. So, and that played a big part, right? You know, and I think that part on the education aspect, from the social aspect of it, you know, where we're dealing with youth, you're also looking at what's going on in the world. So you have, you know, it's very important to keep in contact with the kids. And that's why I was, it's very important for me to meet up with the kids uh, uh, at our school, my own personal kids, you know, I still coach my kid, uh, my own personal kids' basketball teams. You know, all, all my kids, play, uh, my daughters, my sons play sports. So it gives me that interaction and to find out. Because when I wrote, even wrote the book War Within the Hearts, I had a lot of these questions. And I wanted to ask someone, and I realized many of our scholars, may, may, may God bless them, but sometimes they knew the content, but not the context. So it's so important to know what's going on. So I realized when I grew up, I'm like, you know what? All these questions I had, maybe they're going to just write them. Right. I'm going to have the scholars look over it and then send that out. So it's so important for me now, even I have to, if I'm going to give information, I can't I have to keep in mind just knowing the content's not enough, understanding the context of what the kids are going through to what what the, what the culture, what kind of music they listen to. All, all these play a big part. So in some ways it keeps me young, but I think that has helped in, in understanding. So learning from like a religious standpoint uh, uh, aspect of it, but then also learning the secular education, the, just school education. But then also understanding the culture of the group of people that I'm dealing with, from the teachers and saying what's going on with teachers' lives right now to what, what's going on with students' lives and parents and whatever the challenges are. So what I maybe wrote five years, seven years ago, we're rewriting one of the, the, the books right now, and we're doing some like small videos on, on certain topics. Uh, I have like even uh, tonight, like at five, I, 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 we're reteaching that book because we're kind of updating the new stuff. So by these new kids, like 25 kids on Skype, we're getting new information like, oh, hey, you know, you should think about this. And like, okay, this is great. As we're rewriting this new book, we, we decided to teach a class to up so we can learn from the kids also as we're teaching this course about, hey, these are the new, the, the new words, usage. This is how technology change. This is how clothing change, music's change. Uh, what, what are the new influencers? What are the new uh, uh, challenges that kids have has played a big part. Hmm. Uh, share with us uh, how... I mean, the content people say is everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you have a Muslim school, the environment, Islamic messages all around. But when it comes to textbook, what children are reading, mm -hmm. is there, a, you know, if there are 275 or 285 Muslim schools across the country, um, are, 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 is there some satisfactory development in terms of writing books? Uh, which are original, which are good, which are contributing, uh, or bricks and mortar is going up and software is behind it. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, yeah, bricks and mortars, it's, it's not what it is what, 10, 20 years ago, uh, in the sense. So, but there are, there are, there are books, uh, uh, publishers who have written some books. But I always tell every school, like, you know, you might have one publisher for one few grades and another publisher for another, or sometimes bringing in your own, right? And I think that's something that I has to keep in mind. Like, even a few, several, like several years ago, we tried to bring standards. Like, we looked at four or five of the major publishers, like I Love Islam series, uh, Ikra series, you know, Tashkir from South Africa back in, back in the days. Looked at what did our, our some basic things and what were some standards. And But I realized every school has their own demographics, every kind, every, every, all of them have their own boards and then they have their different teachers, right? Like for us, it's very important. All our Islamic studies teachers are also have teaching certificates. So that way they don't just have the religious studies, like our, our, all our middle school and have our, our, our scholars, but at the same time, we, we, we've kind of developed them to get their certification in teaching. So they have some of the methods courses. So 
I think that becomes a big uh, a thing and then it's evolving, especially by middle school, high school. You know, there are, there are going to be those foundational things that everyone needs to know, your, your, your basic understanding, aqidah, uh, but then also the akhlaq aspect, the social issues aspect, understanding Islamic history, understanding the great Islamic history in America. Like the you know you know especially the the, the black leaders of our, our of our community who have made things easier right you know so it's so important for us to like have have these other kids understand who are the movers and shakers to make our lives better even in America context and not always focusing on what happened fourteen hundred years ago we have to make make sure the seal of the prophet those developments but how other places in different years and uh, different time centuries people who played major impacts. So I think, you know, kind of rethinking things and especially the social issue aspect, because you want to give them the necessary tools. So when they're leaving your doors and even in your doors, because there's challenges there too, like, you know, you know, those are going to be there. So like dealing with mental health issues, dealing with like, hey, you know, inf- you know in- so people are going to influence you. The question which I'm raising is that the uh-huh. points which you're bringing up, uh-huh. new books and textbooks sure. are written from that perspective. I, I think in this, the first initial, a lot of people are rewriting stuff, right? I think that's something that you see when they first originally wrote in 15, 20 years ago. Then they were ch- looked over at 10. And now they're making some uh, changes, right, as they go through. And I think that's what now that's what many schools are looking at. Now, publishers are going to have to rethink that or looking at different people to rewrite some of those. But I think that's go- that is the process. But we can't wait for publishers because publishers might not, uh, the person who's writing it might not understand the context of all of it. So sometimes you have to work with educators to do that. Or the educators at the schools are going to take that and say, okay, now how do we how do we d- disseminate it in a way for it to connect with the kids? And that's why I believe it's more about not publishers as it is teachers to hmm. train them the proper way. So, uh, no, I understand the environment, the teachers, <clears throat> but also the uh, you know the textbook. Textbook is a textbook. Textbook sure. anchors teacher. Textbook and curriculum anchors students. And it, it determines a whole lot of things on what people will be tested upon. Sure. America is facing certain challenges, and uh, a lot of societies do. Uh, one of the challenges about, about our diversity, diversity is going to be accepted as American as apple pie, or diversity will always remain a second thought when some demonstration and protest takes place in a louder manner. So this remains an issue. Um, similarly, it, you know, it's a pluralistic society. There are all sort of people, religion, culture, ethnic groups, <laughs> although there are dominant groups as well. But uh, so from in, in that perspective, there was a news item that American uh, Jewish community found that Iqra books somehow uh, are anti-Semitic. And uh, so, our, our, so I don't know the, and, and I was told by this founder that American Jewish community people is sitting in Iqra when he invited, I declined to attend, uh, involved in revising that. So is there a system in which a positive aspect of pluralistic connection, connection with neighbors, relation with other faith communities are taught in a way that whatever uh, the teachings of the Quran and prophets are there are interpreted in this way, which contributes uh, the growth of a society which is good for all people. Yeah, but even that, that was at 2003, which I was right after 9-11, where we went to WGN, talked to them, and they took it completely out of the co- context where the prophets saw them. Because if you're going to throw that out and throw a publisher's name, then I think it needs to be very clear that that was in 2003. Uh, that, that was brought up, and that was regarding the idea that the prophets say when they broke the treaty that you can't trust Jews, and they just used that kind of line. And it was completely taken out of context. Uh, so the, the idea of that, and they, yeah, they have quite a bit of different individuals or Jewish groups that they, they work with. So they have, I have not seen so many groups that have that. They were all looking. If people had, they would, you know, right now having Islamic schools, they realize that you know, individuals who join Islamic schools is better than majority of those terrorists are extreme in, uh, uh, individuals who have done hate cr- crimes or terrorist activities. Majority of them are not connected to a massage or, 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 or a school. So I realize the majority of what it's being taught, I don't think that's, you know, in, in the sense that that fear. But is there a way to look at it? And that's why the teacher and the way that they're going to convey that information, I think it's there. People are really looking. That was at 2002. They've, re, uh, you, know, you know, even looked at it and rewrote uh, uh, 
the Mercy to Mankind book. And they took it from the Mercy to Mankind book, which all of us grew up with. So that, that was uh, the specific book that they had used at that time. But I think there is, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Everyone could kind of look at it and they re rewrite in the way it was is done, especially like 20, 30 years ago to uh, rewriting. But I think a lot of times it's a historical context and making sure the clarification of uh, how that's understood. So I think that that's the, no, no doubt about uh, uh, there. Uh, doubt about it, but also even now adding on, not every book's going to have like, hey, making sure that, you know, the, uh, like how the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, making sure that in, in especially in like social studies, but making sure Islamic schools focus a little bit more on uh, the, the history of, 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 of the Black community uh, and making sure that's going to be touched upon. So you'll see from a religious aspect of it, but just general aspect, that is something that no doubt about it that they are going to kind of convey. But uh, I haven't heard that much about, oh, wow. I love Islam. There's, there's, there's all these uh, anti-Semitic. That's news to me. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, you, you're, you're dealing with youth, and you have been teaching uh, since sure. you were a teenager. Uh, it has been a lifetime dedicated to this. Tell me this: a, a, a general statement. Uh, are Muslim youth better off today? Islamically speaking, because that probably was the reason Muslim schools were established as compared to when you were a teenager and going to school yourself? Uh, I think uh, children are more exposed to, to faith and uh, re uh, resources than we when I grew up. Uh, if I look at majority of my friends uh, who went to weekend school, uh, how many of them pray five times a day, I, you know, there, there's a concern sometimes or how much they know about their faith. So I think it's, it's a balance. I think there are a lot more exposure. You know, I look at my own kids and their friends, what they know and at a young age being exposed uh, to the faith and practicing their faith. The key factor is now is that we have, if parents is the key, see, it's not just kind of information, even in Islamic school. If their parents don't it, it, it make this a stress that this is important, because there are some parents who might say, just send them there just so they don't get uh, inculcated with the society but they themselves don't practice, and then, then just hypocrisy happens. So I think it's a, it's, it's a balance where I, I would see there, if a parent who's also involved in giving that, now you're just pushing that, you're just helping uh, uh, support what you're trying to get across to your child. So I think the resources, opportunities, uh, and even like, you know, you know, when people sometimes, I know there, there has been Islamophobia, but when we grew up in the 90s, uh, in eight, I mean, 80s and 90s going to school, Hey, I'm not talking about really being rough in the comments and, 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 and the comments people used to make when I used to play sports, mom drive, uh, you know, uh, walking, comments that were done. There was a lot more, I feel, than even in the 90s where more people are more sensitive, even though I think now things are being taped more. Uh, but I've realized there's still hatred now, but that it was there before. But I think the generation after, because of 9-11, they all always grew up under attack. So I think that has kind of played a psyche on a lot of our, our, our students too. But that's why I think they also need to know their faith more because now it's being a push more about the faith. A lot of times we just we were like the unknown. So they would just make comments. But now our faith is you the number one uh, Islamophobia, topic. Are you crediting Islamophobia to create better Muslims? I think Islamophobia has woken up people. <laughs> okay. Sometimes you get, you, for now you get very comfortable. I think even my generation, people sometimes were like, oh, we're all the same. Oh, nothing, there's nothing, you know. And it, I think it's, it, ha it helped kind of uh, light a, a little match in their minds or in their heads or in their life to say, wait a minute, you know what? We need to kind of understand ourselves. If we want to respond, we need to know our own faith. And we need our kids to understand how to balance themselves to be proud of who they are in, in a society where sometimes you are the headline uh, for the day. I, I remember watching after 9-11 something, some ABC News. Uh -huh. And the ABC News camera person, a reporter showed up at somebody's home uh, suspecting of something. And that guy said, oh, no, I have nothing to do with this. And he stick out his hand with a beer saying that, look, you know, I even drink beer. And another incident, somebody was sitting on the TV uh, on PBS and he had a, a Muslim uh, with, a, with a tie with the American flag and he lifted up his tie. Look, even my tie is American flag. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a one way some people were handling. And during that time came out a survey uh, with uh, which was published by ISPU, which says I think more than 40% of Muslims 
college going Muslims say that they drink. Mm -hmm. And uh, immediately after that came another survey of Gallup uh, in which also in survey people, you know, 18 to 28 year old uh, said uh, close to, I think 16% that they do binge drinking. I, I mean, I didn't even know what word binge means. So I figured it out what binge drinking means. Uh, do you feel that um, alcohol and drugs are something uh, which is uh, more common among young Muslims or it is as often found as among other young people? No, I, I think now you have more kids, you, Muslim kids using and then kind of following the, 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 the United States norm, right? And that's what we, you know, that's, that's something that's kind of changed because now they're experiencing, now there's two parts to it. When you're now more and more around a community, you get simulated to the community. And when you get simulated to the community, there, 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 it's nothing wrong with it, but there, you have to pick and choose. So now with the, especially weed being legalized, you see more and more kids. And then, you know, they'll, and then kids now can search things. Like I could find a fatwa that says, hey, you know, weed is okay. So people now are, are more, and, and the idea of the social media doing stuff, the shame, modesty is really less, right? So even though there have been opportunities for more uh, learning for kids to happen, and that's why that, that, that navigating of, okay, not just knowing your information, but understanding and implementing it's so important at the house level and there. So at MSAs and all that, there's going to be challenges. There was challenges before, but the, back then there was no videos, no cameras, and there was no research as it is during now. But also the population of Muslims have been increased from when, we, when I grew up, right? So when you have that and it's more of a norm and you're more you know, a part of the community, it's challenges, right? So even me playing high school basketball, maybe even one or two, maybe in the whole United States, or even at a college level, now there's a lot more. So I, I, and people have different ethnic groups. So I think what it does is um, uh, for sure drinking that, you know, that party because you're, you're not, the diversity is more open. People are more uh, inclusive of letting people come in uh, into their social groups. So uh, I agree. Hookah, hookah, hookah lounges are huge. Most of those owners are, are, are Muslim. <laughs> so, so you have all these things and I'll call these all gateway drugs when you start smoking stuff and you're going to try something later after that. So those challenges, no doubt about it, is as and it, it could only get more and more, right? And that's why I think the idea of of of, of kind of making sure that foundational stuff and and, and and the community and you see the programming of communities are now different too, and more social programming than just always like a religious talk and stuff. It's going to be uh, important. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, no Adri, for sparing a good amount of your time with Muslim Network TV, and I hope you will continue to refer great people like yourself uh, so and your neighbors. So we could interview them and we keep building community through communication as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, all of you for watching. Uh, you have been watching Muslim Network TV on Galaxy 19 satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, Apple TV, and a whole lot of social media. Our website is muslimnetwork.tv. And thank you, Sumaya Haider and Aliza Majid for producing today's show. And thank you for the presence of our producer, Abdul Wahid. Peace, salam. Be careful, happy, and productive.